Hi there, Bethel Lalliston. Uh, Ewan Jones here. I'm the pastor at Bethel Baptist Church in Bedros. Many of you will know me. Uh, I used to be a student at Union School of Theology and the assistant pastor at Grace Church in Porth Call. So in both those capacities, I came to preach and share with you in Lalliston uh, on previous occasions. And I would love to have been with you in person over this time. Uh, but unfortunately, you know why that's not the case. It's been a very odd eight or so months, hasn't it? And I know that God has been uh, blessing you and, and sustaining you through that time. I've been thinking of you and uh, chatting with Jim sometimes and thinking of him and the family as well. A very, very unusual time to be leading a church. And so we're grateful to uh, at Bethel in Bedwas for your prayers. I bring the greetings of Bethel Bedwas. Uh, we, like you, have been navigating this time and just trying to figure out what God has uh, planned for us uh, in the months and years ahead as a result of the, the COVID pandemic. And I bring the greetings as well of my family from uh, Rachel, my wife. We've been married nearly 15 years now and our two children, Arthur and Kitty. Uh, so you're very much in our thoughts and prayers as a family and as a church. And I'm really grateful for this chance to be able to share with you. Uh, in just a moment then, we're going to be looking in John chapter 4, a very familiar passage. Uh, but before we do, shall we pray? Father God, we come to your word knowing that even perhaps in stories that we've heard a number of times before, there are still uh, wonderful truths to be mined. Uh, and Lord, that your spirit will apply your word to us today. Um, to speak to our hearts in ways perhaps that, that that hasn't been the case before. Lord, that your word is is pointed and sharp and, and appropriate for us now. Uh, and it speaks into the situations that we're in and, and the places that we're at. And so, Lord, we just ask that, that we would come with humble hearts and that you would open our eyes and ears to be able to hear what you might be saying to us now. Uh, Father, would you speak to us by your Holy Spirit? through uh, these precious words of scripture. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, well, grab a, a Bible if you'd like to follow along. If you've got uh, a physical Bible, you can make notes and scribble and highlight and that kind of thing. We're going to read John chapter 4 from verse 3 through to verse 42. He, that's Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee. That's Jesus. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, that is, about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, well, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right in saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. 
But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Well, just then the disciples came back. They marvelled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone bought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Well, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. And many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and they stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Saviour of the world. Well, may God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Obviously, quite a long passage there. We're going to attempt a bird's eye view in our time today, a glimpse from above uh, into an incredibly rich passage. To give you some idea, Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a 36 sermon series on just this chapter. Well, we barely have 36 minutes, let alone 36 weeks. So here's where we're heading. We're going to see first um, two conversations and, and two points that we'll draw out of those. When you have a personal encounter with Jesus, he invites you to firstly find all your satisfaction in him. And secondly, when you have this encounter with Jesus, he invites you to share him with others. Find all your satisfaction in him and share him with others. So let's first just ask, what's going on here in, in the passage? Maybe you already know some of the background, but let's just see the scene as John lays it out so that we're all on the same page. We're early on in Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist has laid the groundwork, prepared the platform, and then stepped out of the way for Jesus to begin. In chapter 2, John has told us about Jesus' first sign, turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana. This picture of the joyful entrance of God's kingdom into a broken world. And he's already riled up the religious establishment by unleashing his anger in the temple, turning over the tables of the money changers, those who have made religion into either a business or a burden. And then in chapter 3, Jesus had a late night visit from Nicodemus, the respected religious leader, who left just as much in the dark as when he arrived. Now in chapter 4, John tells us in verse 1 that Jesus' disciples have been baptising many people. So word is getting around and now to let the nervous Pharisees cool off a bit, Jesus heads north away from Jerusalem back towards Cana in Galilee. John says in verse 4 that Jesus had to travel through Samaria and he fills in the significance of that for us in verse 9. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus could have gone around the long way but he was compelled to take this more direct route even though it was through hostile territory. And this hostility, it was religious and it was racial and it went back centuries. And whilst the Jews considered themselves God's pure people, they looked down on those in Samaria, the old northern kingdom, who were a mix of many nations, they'd been moved and intermarried and so on. So it was an issue of who was and who wasn't a part of God's true people. 
And on top of that, it's a woman who Jesus approaches when he gets to the well. Now, culturally, this was a big no-no. And so with this background, we're meant to have this sense of shock at the personal, relational encounter that unfolds here in chapter 4. With all that background, then, it brings us to our first point. When you have an encounter with the person of Jesus, he will invite you to firstly find all your satisfaction in Jesus. Find all your satisfaction in him. And we're going to look at verses 7 to 18 to see that. The disciples have gone into the nearest town to find a a, a Greg's and Jesus finds himself at Jacob's well, thirsty, under the scorching heat of the midday sun. He's been walking since daybreak and whatever was in the the group flask has run out long ago. His head is pounding from the dry heat. His throat is parched. He's properly thirsty. You know that feeling, don't you? From this place then of needing help, Jesus sets in motion a life-changing encounter for the Samaritan woman. And he does it with one simple question. This is Jesus doing personal evangelism 101, faith sharing at its most simple and effective. Put yourself in the position of need and ask for help with something. Jesus says simply, I'm so thirsty. Can you give me something to drink? The woman is as shocked uh, as John's readers are meant to be. Can you feel her awkwardness and her embarrassment in the way she responds? Maybe there's fear and suspicion mixed up in it a bit as well. But she says, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman to boot. You're going to get us both into big trouble if you keep talking with me. But Jesus turns the conversation around. He says to her, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for living water. You see that there in verse 10. The woman replies practically, and perhaps even with a bit of mockery at this surreal conversation that's taking place. She says, sir, you don't have a bucket. You've just asked me for a drink. Are you somehow greater than Jacob who built this will? I I don't think so. Are you just going to magic up this living water from nowhere? But Jesus holds out to her an invitation, a beautiful offer. Look, he says, I have a source of life, a living water. And when you drink from that, it will quench your thirst forever. It will satisfy your every need right down to the core of your soul so thoroughly and completely that you will never need to look for satisfaction anywhere else ever again. And the living water that I'm offering you, it'll be like this mini well in you, in your spirit, and it will become a source of true and everlasting life. What is this living water that Jesus is talking about? Well, John himself, the gospel writer, gives us the answer from Jesus' words a little bit later in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 44. If you have your Bible, uh, flip over a page or two to see that verse 37, where Jesus again offers living water. John writes this. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is quoting Old Testament scripture there in verse 38. He's saying, I'm the one from whom rivers of living water flow. And in verse 39, John helps us understand what Jesus means by that. John says this, Jesus spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. So when Jesus offers living water to the woman, he's inviting her, believe my words and receive my spirit. This is the profound thing that's happening here. He's saying, you don't know who I am yet, but as you come to realize who it is that's holding out this gift of life to you, and if you trust and obey my words... I will give you my Holy Spirit to live in you, to change you, to satisfy you completely and guarantee you eternal life to meet your deepest needs. Jesus offers nothing less here than life in the Spirit. 
that same offer to be born of the Spirit that was held out to Nicodemus in chapter 3. Nicodemus couldn't grasp it. He was the religious one, the respected one, a man, a political leader, a Jew, a law keeper, an insider, but he didn't recognise Jesus. He didn't understand Jesus' words. He came to visit Jesus in the dark and he left as much in the dark. But what's the woman's response here to to Jesus' offer of of life-giving spirit? She says to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. In contrast to Nicodemus, she is, as we'll see in a moment, the irreligious one, the disrespected one in her community, a woman, a Samaritan, an adulterer, an outsider across the board, and yet she responds to Jesus' words with simple trust, not with complete understanding, but with faith nonetheless. Now, before she can receive this thirst-quenching gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus needs to just deal with a major obstacle. Take a look at verse 16. Jesus says to her, Go call your husband and come back here. She answered him, I have no husband. And he says, well, you're right there, for you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now, number six, is not your husband. What you've said is true. If you were the woman, how would you have felt in that moment? I think we should note this, that Jesus is exposing sin in her life, but he's not trying to crush her or shame her. With compassion and love, he wants to show her that the deep issue behind her adultery is this. She's looking to something other than God to satisfy her. She's looking for escape from one man to another to another. And we see this every day in our culture, don't we? Whether it's in the bed of a man or a video of a woman, a physical accomplishment, a natural high, a job well done, a successful child, a high essay score, being recognised for something. We look for satisfaction in all sorts of other things. And Jesus wants to expose that. He wants to expose our escape routes to show ultimately how empty and dissatisfying they are. That they don't really allow us to escape at all. Rather, they trap us. They trap us. But then, when we've seen that, Jesus wants us to see how abundantly, perfectly satisfying he is. And so he's not trying to shame and punish this woman. He's trying to expose these escape routes that she has taken to try and uh, get out of the, the harshness of this life. And to reveal to her that they will never satisfy her, but he will. You see, the heart of humanity's sin is that we haven't truly believed Jesus for his promise of living water that will quench every thirst. We've rejected his words, we've forfeited the gift of his spirit. But there's something even more scandalous for those of us today who have already encountered Jesus and yet still choose to look elsewhere for ultimate satisfaction. And it's this, God hurls this accusation at his people in Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, chapter 2, verse 13. He, he accuses them of this. My people have committed two evils, he says. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold any water. What a terrible description of what God's people are capable of. God, in his Son, holds out here words of eternal life, living water for us to receive freely, and yet we forsake it in order to do what? To to dig our own pathetic little cisterns that just give trickles of water, and mixed with the dirt and dust, we lie on our fronts like animals and, and lick and drink from these stupid little holes in the ground. It's a pathetic image, isn't it, that God paints of the sin of his people when he is holding out living water. It is sin enough to forsake the life that God has given us and sin on top of that sin to imagine that anything else might satisfy us in place of Jesus. 
So there's a warning for any of us here today who have accepted Jesus' offer and yet now forsake it for some dead-end escape route, trying to find satisfaction in anything other than him. There's a lot going on here, so let's just take a moment to consider our hearts, to reflect on your own lives as they stand today. Where are you looking for satisfaction? What's your default escape route in difficult times? What are those things you look to to give you quick fixes of satisfaction under stress? Here are some questions perhaps to help us out as we think about that. Where, When you've had one of those unutterably awful days, what escape route do you dream about? What's your fantasy life? Is it a person? Is it a house? Is it a, a retirement? When you're alone and tired or hurt or stressed, what source of satisfaction or who does your heart instinctively incline you to reach for? What hobby or possession or place or person could you feel like you you just couldn't live without? Picture that thing for a moment. Hold it in your mind's eye and now ask yourself honestly, Am I trying to find my deepest satisfaction in this rather than in Jesus? In order for the woman to accept Jesus' offer of living water, he needed to expose where it was that her heart had been looking for satisfaction. And in this moment, Jesus, the perfect man, becomes her man number seven. But he doesn't want to use her like all those men of the past. No, he wants to free her. So he speaks words of life to her and he offers her relationship with God in a life transformed by the Holy Spirit. Don't we need this living water too? Doesn't this world, doesn't Lalliston and Bedworth and our town and friends and family, don't they need to know the satisfaction that Jesus can bring? Don't they need the hope of his words, the closeness of a heavenly father, the promise of eternal life by the Holy Spirit? You see, Jesus goes on to show the woman that what satisfies us is what becomes the object of our worship. And he does this in verses 19 to 27. And we don't have time now really to dig into the details of this second conversation. But let's just see this. The woman says... Let's turn the focus off of me for a moment. We've been talking about my husband's and the man I'm living with and it's all getting a bit heavy. Let's talk theology, Jesus. Let's get into a Jews versus Samaritans debate. But Jesus isn't drawn into that. He showed her that our worship isn't about race or place. It's about a person. And so whatever we find our satisfaction is is in, well, that naturally becomes our idol. But our worship, well, it should flow out of a personal encounter with Jesus. It's what naturally bubbles up from that spring of water that by grace he places in us. Twice, he says, in verse 23 and verse 24, it's worship in spirit and in truth. And it's possible because of this Holy Spirit in us, and it's driven by the truth of Jesus' words, and it's directed to the Father who is actively seeking those whose hearts are ready to respond in gratitude and obedience to him. So worship is not now a matter of race or place, it's a matter of the heart. And that's what he shows the, the, the woman in this second, uh, in this second uh, conversation that really we're talking about the same thing, the satisfaction of our hearts and the direction of our worship as a result of it. When it comes to worship then, do you get distracted by issues that actually don't matter? That aren't matters of the heart, but rather are matters of taste or style? Do you care more about the building that you are in, or indeed in lockdown you are not in? Do you care about the order of the service or the format that it takes, the style of the music or the songs that are chosen? Do you uh, get het up or care about the person who is leading you in worship? See, all of those things are tools, but they can just as easily become our idols. And if that happens, we're missing the point, or rather, we're missing the person. Our worship stops becoming about Jesus 
and it becomes about the means by which we worship together. We know this, don't we? We've thought about it more than ever in, in this last six or seven months. God doesn't live in a building. He doesn't have a favourite musical instrument or genre. God is present in us, his church, by his Holy Spirit, and we worship him not with empty ritual and religious practice or repetitive ceremonies, but with an overflow of joyful obedience and gratitude. We worship Jesus um, out of the overflow of the love of our hearts. Worshipping Jesus is a spirit-fueled response to his love. It occurs in the whole of our lives. And that is why, while lockdown has been difficult and having our churches shut has been difficult and we haven't been able to worship together in the way we love to do, we still have been able to be church together. Even when we're apart, we have still been able to worship God because it is the whole of our lives and it flows out of our hearts and who we are. But you'll have found it hard to worship in this time if you're not satisfied with Jesus. If, if your worship is simply about what happens in church on a Sunday, you will have found it hard because Jesus is showing that worship is a heart matter, a whole life matter. And so you will have really struggled to worship with your heart and life over this time if you're more concerned about what happens in the gathering. Now, if a life of worship feels like a struggle at the moment, I'll be honest, for me sometimes it does as well because I miss worshipping with my brothers and sisters. We can use these same questions that we just thought through to identify what is stealing the praise that belongs to Jesus and him alone. Where is your satisfaction coming from at this moment? Where do you look to in the hard times? What are your idols that have perhaps taken the place of Jesus? Okay, we need to keep moving on. I said that there were two things that we'd look at that spring from a conversation, an encounter with Jesus. And the second is that, that he invites us to share him with others, to share Jesus with others. And we see that in verses 28 to 42. So let's spend the rest of our time just learning from this beautiful, messy example of how the woman responds to Jesus. Have you ever been in the middle of one of those profound, deep conversations with someone and then suddenly someone with zero self-awareness just wanders on into the room and completely breaks the spell? You know in that moment that you can't resuscitate that conversation, can you? It's dead and gone. You need to just move on. Well, that's what happens here. You see, right after Jesus has just explained to the woman that he is the Messiah that they have been waiting for in verse 26... Immediately the disciples return in verse 27 and they blunder on in with their bags of lunch. The woman can see their surprise at the scene. It's just written all over their faces and she knows, well, that's it. This beautiful conversation that was unfolding with Jesus is, is just dead in the water. And so she leaves her water jar there. She's going to come back after all and she heads back to the town. Look at what she does. It should be such an encouragement to any of us today who struggle with sharing our faith. Because in that moment, she's only just met Jesus, but she faithfully offers her half-formed, spontaneous testimony. The woman whose label across town is man-eater knocks on all the doors of her neighbours and stands in the marketplace and says, Come and see a man. I've met another man. It might not be the first time that she said those words to her neighbours. But this man is different, she pleads. Come and see him. He knew my mistakes, my details about my life that he couldn't possibly have known unless he was a prophet. But he didn't condemn me for them. I know it sounds crazy, but could he be the Messiah? Maybe you can imagine the response of the people. Some are curious to see Jesus. They're moved by the woman's passion. Others flip out their camera phones and they're looking forward to this entertaining car crash of an encounter. What man has she found now, do you reckon? What's this one going to be like? What's number six going to say about the new guy? While she's in the town sharing her story, Jesus is trying to explain to the confused disciples what's going on. They're trying to get Jesus to eat something, 
but he's talking in metaphors again. Look in verse 33. He says to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He's saying to them, guys, don't you get it? You can put the steak bakes away and the, the vegan sausage rolls. I'm right in the middle of doing what satisfies my soul the most. This is my food. I'm doing what the Father sent me to do. So let's just ask, what did the Father send Jesus to do? What is this work that needs finishing? Well, here again, we can look to John to get what Jesus is really saying. Back in John chapter 3, verse 17, he wrote this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God gave his son to a parched, dissatisfied, sin-ravaged world in order to save it. Jesus, the word made flesh, was sent to reveal the Father's love for us and to hold out this offer of living water, his spirit for eternal life. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, says John. Whoever hears his words and obeys them, they are saved. God sent Jesus to save us. And Jesus knew that this was going to finish at the cross where he would die a sinner's death, where he would shed his blood for the sins of the world and then three days later rise victorious from the grave. So for Jesus, every offer of salvation held out, every step towards the cross was like nourishing, flavoursome food for him. Look, open your eyes, he says to the disciples, as a crowd of people appear on the horizon, heading from town, led by the woman. He says, I heard you talking about the crops earlier, how there's still four months before the harvest is ripe and the farmers will be able to gather it back in. It doesn't have to work like that in the spiritual fields. You don't have to wait. Today, there's no waiting necessary. He says, I sowed the seed of eternal life in the heart of that woman and look up. She's already sown it amongst the people of her town and it's produced a harvest of precious souls waiting for that same living water. Now we know normally a farmer sows his crops. He has the privilege and the joy of bringing in the harvest. He's, he's done all that work and he waits and he, uh, and he gets the privilege of bringing it in. Jesus says this in verse 36. But then he says it's different when it comes to the work of the Spirit. You see, one might sow God's words and then never get to reap that harvest. Here in verse 38, Jesus says that the disciples, they get to help to bring in the harvest, even though it's the Samaritan woman who has sowed the words of Jesus amongst her townfolk. The disciples get the privilege of sharing in the joy of reaping. We get to share Jesus. And, and so often we can make that into a really big deal. But look at what the Samaritan woman, uh, her example, just to see how God honours our simple, faithful efforts. Her testimony in verse 29 and in verse 39 is so simple. It's simply this. Come and see a man. We too get to hold out a person. We're not holding out a system or a religion or a building, or a tradition, or a holy club. Like our satisfaction, like our worship, the object of our evangelism is Jesus, a person. We get to share in the gladness of seeing people come to know Jesus. And when all these people arrive from the town, we see in verse 40 how they just beg Jesus to stay. He agreed to stay with them for two days. Imagine their joy. See how the townsfolk explain to the woman what happened in verse 42. Now we believe, they say, not because of what you said, precious though that testimony was, but they say, we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the saviour of the world. <laughs> what an impression that Jesus must have made on them, that they would recognise that this, that he was the Messiah. Even Nicodemus was so far from getting that, despite his knowledge of the scriptures. Here, this Samaritan town gets it. God's will and his work 
Jesus' food for which he came. They get him. Imagine life in that village from there on in. Imagine how many others heard the good news and saw the transformation in their neighbours. This is revival. Her testimony, her invitation was one thing, but what brought lasting, heart-changing faith was when they had their own personal encounters with the person of Jesus. Now, where do we encounter Jesus now? Not in the form of a man who can only come and stick around in our village for two days. No, we encounter Jesus in his word every day and by his life-giving spirit living in us. This is why we hold out his word to others. We have the privilege of offering that same invitation to receive living water. That's the privilege that we have, isn't it? Eternal life for a dry, desperate, dead world. Now many will refuse it, choosing to still find their satisfaction elsewhere. But anyone who will acknowledge the depth of, of their insatiable thirst, they can have their eyes opened to the satisfying salvation that Jesus alone can give. And so it begs the question for us as a church, why does it feel like we don't see a great harvest ready to be brought in. It does feel like that sometimes, doesn't it? I wonder if sometimes the problem can be just that those we long to share the gospel with believe they have no need of it. Those that we want to tell Jesus about and long to come, they, they have no need of it in their minds. They're not willing to admit yet their thirst. Have you tried sharing the gospel with people who believe they're already truly satisfied? It's a very middle class problem. They respond with incredulity or apathy. They say, well, why do I need living water? I, I've got my nice house, my social life, my health, my active lifestyle, my high achieving children. These are the ones that don't thirst. And I think an opportunity that's come from these last seven or eight months is just that for some people they've realized that these things that they hold on to as the sources of satisfaction are not uh, as able to keep the promises that they make as they perhaps thought they could. That they're not firm foundations. They are not deep wells to be drawing from. Now I'm not saying we stop sharing the gospel with people who feel like they don't have any need of God. We should pray desperately that their hearts would soften, that they would see how inadequate their chosen escape routes will turn out to be. And maybe that's something that God's been doing for a lot of people during this time. And, and we need to be ready to show them that Jesus offers something much more precious, much more satisfying and something that lasts into eternity. But here there's this challenge for us to consider. Alongside that, I want to ask us this. Are we avoiding those whose need is really clear? And in doing so, are we missing out on the joy of seeing the fields of wheat, the harvest being brought in? Perhaps like the disciples, we too should share their surprise at who Jesus was ministering to. Someone irreligious in that culture, a, a woman a sinner, an unclean Samaritan, an outcast, an outsider. The last person that they thought Jesus should be spending time with. Are we surprised with them? Where are the outcasts, the outsiders in your community? There must be many around you with great needs, spiritual and physical where are the sinners? Where are those who know that they need something more to satisfy them, that the things that they've turned to for satisfaction are not meeting their needs? Where are those whose spirits are just crying out? They're just longing to worship something, but they don't know where to direct their praise, and so it goes in all the wrong places. Where are those who long for the truth in a world that has lied to them since they were born? Where are the unimpressive people, the needy, the broken, the humbled? They're trying every escape route you can imagine from drugs to drink to pornography to sports to work to partying to relationships to uh, computer games, whatever it is. 
The fields are ready to be harvested. And so often we find ourselves swinging the sickles in the wrong place. They're waiting over there, they're desperate, and we're over here where there's no harvest to be reaped yet. What's more, when you hold out Jesus to those who know they are thirsty, who know their escape routes have failed, they will show us the work of naturally sharing Jesus, holding out that invitation that, that, that many of us find so difficult to do, just like the woman so naturally shared her testimony. When you meet people who are thirsty for Jesus, they're the best natural evangelists in the world. So I want us to ask that as we really come to a close. Are we looking in the wrong place? Is the right field over there while we're frustrated and seeing no fruit and ready to give up over here? Friends, thank you for bearing with me. If you're seeking satisfaction or anything uh, anywhere other than in Jesus, I can promise you now, you'll never never be truly satisfied. If you've turned from Jesus to anything else for satisfaction, then please heed the warning of that prophecy in Jeremiah. Turn away from those dry, cracked cisterns that you've dug and turn to the true source of living water. Or maybe now the Holy Spirit is just stirring up in you an encouragement to be alert to hold out the person of Jesus where there's real need. And so, as Jesus says to his disciples, open your eyes. Start looking. Where are the fields ripe for harvest? Where do you go? Where should you go? Our faith is about a person. Jesus, the Son of God. Our true, lasting satisfaction can only be found in an encounter with him. Our worship, it must find its centre in him, the person of Jesus. Our evangelism, sharing our faith, is about nothing more than him holding out a person, Jesus. The whole of the Christian life begins with an encounter with a person. Jesus, who is deeply satisfied as he invites us with open arms to drink freely of the living water, that we would never thirst again. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you that the moments in, in his ministry that he was most satisfied was when he was holding out the offer of salvation to thirsty, needy, broken, sinful, outcast people. Lord, we see it in this encounter with the woman from Samaria. We see it most supremely at the cross where his arms were spread wide for the sake of the salvation of the world. That anyone who recognises their need, their thirst, their desperation could turn to him, could believe and call on the name of Jesus that they might find satisfaction in him, that they might find living water that wells up a spring uh, that never runs dry, eternal life, true, deep, lasting, life-giving satisfaction. We thank you that Jesus humbled himself, made himself nothing, emptied himself of his heavenly glories that he might come and live amongst us and die for the least and for the lost. We praise and thank you that our Lord Jesus rose again in victory, that he proved that he is the source of true, glorious, eternal life. We thank you that our Lord Jesus is alive today and reigns at the right hand of the Father and that this offer of salvation is now in our hands, the church, to be his arms and legs and voice in this world, to hold him out to a needy, thirsty people. Lord, show us. Show us where we should be spreading the gospel. Show us who truly is ready and, and thirsty and needy for this life-giving word of Christ. Father, inspire us. Challenge us. And show us as well, Lord, where we as Christians might be piling sin upon sin by not looking to our Saviour for true satisfaction, but looking elsewhere, looking around us for other things to satisfy us. Forgive us for our sin in doing that and please help us 
draw us again to the true source of living water. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Uh, renew in us clean hearts that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus with gratitude and hope for the future.